Hello, literacy leaders and champions. Welcome to Literacy Talks. We are so excited to welcome you to this podcast series from Reading Horizons, dedicated to exploring the ideas, trends, insights, and practical issues that will help us all improve our professional practice in teaching reading. Our series host is Stacy Hurst, professor at Southern Utah University and chief academic officer at Reading Horizons, where reading momentum begins. Joining Stacy are Donnell Pons, a recognized expert in literacy and special education, and Lindsay Kemeny, a Utah-based elementary classroom teacher. Today's topic, the art and science of teaching. Let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Literacy Talks. Joining me today, as always, is Lindsay Kemeny and Donnell Pons. And today we are going to talk about the meaning of a phrase that I think those of us in education may have heard many times. And it is this, the art and science of teaching. So I really have no fancy lead in, but I am really looking forward to the conversation that I'm going to have with you guys. So I'm going to start by asking each of you, what does that phrase mean to you? So Lindsay, let's start with you. Well, when I think of the science of teaching, I think of research. I think of solid things we know. You know, there's this evidence base that we can build our approaches on. And then when I think of the art of teaching, I think of a few things. I think of how you connect with your students, your instructional delivery, those split moment decisions a teacher makes in a lesson, how she looks at her students and sees if her instruction is having the desired effect, how she makes it engaging and effective and her pacing and all those things I kind of think go together into the art of teaching. That is well said. Donna, what do you think? Okay. It got me thinking about this one because it, it, you hear the phrase often when you're talking about education. And I looked up, it was interesting, the Yale uh, Center for Education, they have a website and they have a whole article on the art of teaching. And one of the phrases out of it says, every successful teacher is an artist. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Doesn't that sound just wonderful? Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to detail that the science of teaching describes how, this is what they're saying, how teaching should go. The art suggests the unique way teaching unfolds as a teacher pursues these and other practices. So it's kind of along the same lines as what Lindsay was thinking too. And so we're thinking of the science as the nitty gritty that's involved in the how we're teaching. And then that art suggests the unique ways in which we teach. With reading, it's very interesting. I think I I love that we're having this conversation because it's particularly important to understand where science and the art of teaching come together in a classroom, I think. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I think often about um, a lot of things that Louisa Moat says, actually. (laughs) But one thing that she's mentioned frequently is that as a profession, and I, I do believe this is changing. We have had entire podcast episodes on books and things that guide teaching the teaching of reading but historically and Lindsay if we think back even to when we were in the classroom and fully embracing balanced literacy there were no seminal works that I knew of that we could refer to so whether you're talking about science or knowledge there wasn't a body of work that we learned as a pre-service teacher in the same way um, that maybe a medical student starts with Gray's Anatomy And that is the actual term, right? It's not just the TV show. They have this this body of knowledge or these seminal works that they refer to. And the way that we were taught to approach teaching and specifically teaching reading, there weren't a lot. Like I could say um, classroom management maybe, but it wasn't really research-based. It was a popular book is what it was. It was Harry Wong. I don't know. Did you guys learn that? Yeah. It was just a lot of cool things put together in it palatable way. So I think there's a lot that goes into that phrase. When you guys both talked about that art being the application part of it, can you think of some specific examples that you've seen the art 
of teaching? Yeah, I can think of some because for example, I think you're with the art of teaching, you're being really reactive. You're really understanding the strengths and weaknesses of your students, right? And so just today, one of my students had like a little altercation with someone at recess. And so he came in, was sitting at the carpet. I knew that had happened and he was still a little emotional, like like trying to calm himself down, right? So as I'm doing kind of call response activity, he's not responding, So I know, you know, maybe normally for another student, I'm going to do a little tap to be like, oh, I need everyone saying it. But at this moment for this student, like he just, if I had like said his name or something and said, oh, I don't hear you, he just would have broken down. Right. So I just think sometimes it's knowing when to push and when, when not to, um, sometimes you do, you know, like for phonics, we might start with a little review. And sometimes I do the review and, oh my goodness, like half the class doesn't remember this. Well, okay, I'm changing my instruction right now then because I've got to go over that a little bit, you know, more in depth before we go on to our next concept. So sometimes you're teaching and you're like, oh, I can tell they're getting a little restless or this is going really slow. So I've got to change pace or we've got to do a turn and talk or we got to break it up somehow. So I think those are a few examples. Yeah, that is a good example. You're constantly assessing. And so based on your knowledge and experience, you can react or respond to that in ways that you know will be effective. As you were talking, I have one class. And this is unusual for the classes I teach. They're really quiet. And so when I ask a question to the whole class, crickets. I will say there's one kid and I hate it when he's absent because I know I can count on him to respond. But when I do things like say, turn and talk, or um, I want you to think about this and write it down or just something different, then I get that out of them. So anyway, I just thought it was funny because usually college students are pretty talkative. It's an unusual class. My class this year is very talkative. So it's like you give them, <laughs> you give them an inch and they go a mile, you know, they just, you know, so <laughs> any question, they're all, woo, they all have so much to say. <laughs> That's a fun problem to have too, right? I think it is funny how we adjust to that because with the class I was talking about as well, now I'm in the habit. I rarely ask a question out loud to the whole class. I just start with turn and talk. We don't even yeah. like, that's a good example. Donna, what are you thinking of in the way of the art being applied? I was just thinking of going through a teacher training program and the term with itness was used a lot. And I think the with itness, really they were referring to the art of teaching. And that is just being aware, like Lindsay has mentioned, being aware of your students. You get to know them. And so over time, you pick up on the cues that they're giving you. You're able to pace yourself. So you, we hear a lot in teaching reading this idea of how do I know the pace? How do I set the pace for what I'm teaching? And that takes teacher with itness. That's a blending of science and art. And so to give somebody a very firm, definitive answer, you're going to be here on Monday. You're going to be here on Wednesday, particularly with teaching reading. That is impossible to do. But that's where the art and science come together as a really well-trained teacher who's well-informed, has a good coach. Even we're hearing a lot about coaching to help with many teachers. We have these reading coaches and I see them across the country. It's, it's a really nice thing to see. Somebody else coming into the classroom who has experience being in other classrooms too to bring that level of knowledge about the material that you're teaching. But then there's no replacement for the teacher in the classroom who's been with those students who knows their needs and understands when they see like Lindsay does across the room and can tell when this is going to work for that one, this isn't going to work for that one. And they you do it so so effortlessly, it really is art. It's like watching a nice ballet or something when someone's got all the moves down. I mean, I've just an experience today with adult students, adult learners. And even though we've been in a Zoom situation, I can still pick up on those cues. As a teacher, you just find ways to find those cues. Even though we're not personally together, even through Zoom, I know those students. I know what I'm seeing. I know what I'm hearing. That's that's the with itness, the art piece coming in together with the science, I think. Yeah, and being able to respond in the moment. I love that you brought up Zoom because I think we've all learned different behaviors surrounding that. And that very class I'm talking to you about, we had on Zoom instead of face-to-face. 
And they were so willing to respond in the comments. Most of them, actually, no surprise to you from what I've already told you, the one kid who always answers me, his Zoom camera was the only one that was on. <laughs> so I felt like he and I were just having a conversation. <laughs> but in the chat, I gave them lots of opportunities to engage and respond that way. And they were just, it seemed like so much more willing. I never would have thought about that before. When you're on Zoom and you realize I have to do a little bit maybe more or something different to keep these students engaged, then you do, you dig in, you learn if you don't know, and then you apply. I also appreciate that you mentioned pacing because that is something you can learn about attention span. You can learn about anticipatory sets or ways to pull your students into that lesson and how to keep it moving. But until you do it, until you apply it, you're really limited. I love having a perky pace. And so I, I've had a lot of people come in and kind of see, oh, you have a quick pace, but it is. It's like this art of of seeing how quick you can do it with that class, but still have everyone with you. And you don't want to go too slow because then it's not as engaging. And I just remember my principal came in to observe me last year and had commented, you know, they fill out these observation forms and, you know, had commented, oh, I was a little worried because, you know, you had a very quick pace. But when I looked around, every single student was right with you and engaged. And so it is, it's something that's kind of gets better over time and you perfect it you know, the more you practice. That is so true. That's the thing I tell my pre-service teachers all the time. They notice, they feel that pacing isn't quite there and they feel when they're getting better at it. But I tell them, you really just have to do it for a while. And then I don't know if you guys would agree with this because you can have different situations in different instructional settings. I wouldn't say I'm a master at pacing yet. It's like every year might be different or every, even every day, because one student is struggling this day and, and isn't with you. You know, and I will say, I'll add to what, what you're saying. I'll, I love all this conversation about pacing and I will add the perky pace, you know, that Lindsay, you kind of brought up the perky pace and I'm all about the perky pace too. I've sat in too many classrooms where things are moving just too slowly. Later, the teacher will say something like, well, I want to make sure everybody's with me. The problem is no one was any longer with you because they had kind of shut down. And particularly with the information that you're giving, you want to keep it coming in a steady stream so the engagement is there. I call it the steady stream. So it might feel perky to somebody else, but it's more a steady stream. And that becomes really possible when you know your material really well, too. Because like Lindsay said, maybe one day the student over here is struggling. My perky pace continues, but I'm switching up what we're doing in order to give more review, perhaps. But that only comes from having really good background knowledge of what it is I'm teaching, right? And and lots of experience with it. So you can whip out this tool or that tool. And that only comes, like I say, when you've been using it for quite a while. So I also think, again, it's that beautiful relationship between the two of the art and the science. And you really can't have one without the other. I've been in classrooms where a really well-read teacher knows the material, but doesn't really understand understand the students, hasn't really connected with the students and how to keep that material moving. And that can be challenging to be in too. One thing I love about framing teaching in those two terms, the art and science, I feel like with the science, especially the science that we talk about when we're talking about reading development and teaching reading is a lot of it is settled. I mean, that's the nature of science. We have a foundation Yes, we're always adding to it and refining and moving forward. But if we just went on that, if we just went on this is the science and maybe this is how you should do it, we wouldn't have individualization in our teaching either. I personally would not want to just be handed a curriculum that aligns 110% with science and all you have to do is read it because I don't believe that's going to happen. <laughs> but I also appreciate that my teaching style will be different than yours, Donnell, and Donnell's is going to be different than Lindsay's. And that doesn't mean that anyone is less effective, because we can make it our own. And I think teachers really thrive on that. I would not like my career if I couldn't do that. Yeah, I like those high quality instructional materials are so important. I think it's great to have a script, but the art is knowing when you need to go off that script. And sometimes you do. And sometimes we get so into, oh, you need to teach this program with fidelity, but we still have to remember that we have to be considering our students' needs 
And it's that art piece as well. There is both an art to teaching and a science of teaching. Share your insights on how these key components come together to support student success and to learn more about effective practical literacy strategies and classroom tips, sign up today for our newsletter. Visit readinghorizons.com slash literacy talks. And I think some of the most fulfilling moments in my career have been when I went with the teaching moment, no matter what was next on the schedule. I remember a couple of times um, we missed recess or something else that was coming up because we were just following our curiosity and you can't always script that. I don't know if my class would ever be curious enough (laughs) to miss recess. (laughs) They live for that. (laughs) I I love that, Stacey. I love it. (laughs) You know what? You know what? They frequently missed it for. I'll be totally honest. And I look back now and I know I could have taught this so much better, but it was writing. They loved writing. And I'm going to say the word writer's workshop because that's what we called it. But they loved it. (laughs) I could have done a better job in that case with the science and improving their skill. Um, But they did have a lot of passion for it, which was great. What I do want to um, mention with that too, because Darnell, you said this, you can't have one without the other. And I know there have been times in my life when I've had more of one than the other in different situations, um, instructional settings. And I'm wondering if you guys have thought about the limitations of not having enough of one or too much of another. What would do you think a classroom would look like if, say, a teacher had too much of the art so I think what, what I find interesting about this, because Stacey, you even mentioned it, at different times, once you've had, you have both and you have a really good balance between them, you know when you don't. So it's only after you've maybe, and we've all experienced when maybe I had too much of one because I didn't have enough of the other and I was learning to have enough of the other. And we've all been in that situation. I think if you're teacher attuned to know that, oh, this is where my balance is. This feels really good. I've got enough of each. This is a really nice mix of the two. And that takes some time to put together, right? That's why teachers thankfully have some years to prepare and hopefully they're being mentored. And again, coaching, coaches coming in to help with a lot of the science of reading that's making its way into classrooms to help support teachers as they get the information and more of the science aspect into their teaching. So there'll be finding, there'll be a lot of teachers across the country, maybe for the first time, maybe they've been teaching for five years and are comfortable with what they've been doing are now implementing new material and and discovering some of the science of reading and implementing it in. And so maybe they're going to be finding that balance now too. Maybe they were in balance for a while with what they had. For me, oftentimes when I see too much art, I'm not seeing enough stuff getting done. I think that's, that's just the way to put it. There's not enough stuff getting done. And in a classroom where you have a nice balance, the students, as you say, are engaged. They know that their teacher has something for them. The kids' eyes are right on that teacher. They know stuff is happening in that corner of the room. And then stuff is happening. They're getting things done. There's evidence of whatever it is. And so for me, that's always what I'm looking for when I'm in a classroom. And when you walk into classrooms where that's happening, you can almost feel a buzz uh, with what's going on in the classroom and the kids are really engaged. Time should move. We should get some of that flow happening for students where they're not just clock watching the entire time. And mind you, some of the day is just going to be that way, but they should be getting some of that flow where 20 minutes have passed and they're not quite sure. I love it when a class ends when I'm tutoring and we get caught up and it's like, oh dear, class is over. Whoops, we got to end. It's my favorite is because we worked right up to that clock and no one noticed. I do love that. In my current setting, do you know what that looks like? Not everybody packing up their backpack five minutes before we're done with class. Um, And I did that as a student. So I am well aware that's a thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. Just to answer a question, like Donnell said, quality teaching needs a balance of both. And um, so I think both are necessary, but I do think you can do more harm if you're all art and no science than the other way around. I watched a teacher and she she was teaching online, which is kind of difficult. And it was like all science. She was doing everything perfectly right, but there was, it was just very rote, very, I mean, there was no style, no emotion. It was kind of boring. And so, you know, the kids weren't so engaged, but they were still learning. 
so there's no damage being done. But I think the other way, if we're just all art and just having fun and just only thinking about engagement, then the students are missing out on really important learning opportunities. So you make me think about a lot of things. And Donnell, when you were talking too, if I understood you correctly, as teachers, if we don't have enough of one, we compensate with the other. And so that is something I'm going to pay more attention to in my own teaching. But I think about um, the art and science and the way that we're approaching teaching reading now. And of course, it's because of my current setting. But my main focus is making sure that my pre-service teachers know enough about the science. We do have a lot of opportunities to apply it as well. But when you're talking about timeline of teacher development, the time to know the science is before you get into the classroom. Because Lindsay, like you just said, that's the best case scenario. If you leave with so much time being in a classroom, maybe you've picked up things that aren't aligned with the science or just feel good to you um, rather than what we should be doing. It also makes me think about the critique that phonics instruction historically got, and usually the phrase drill and kill followed the word phonics. And I, as you were saying that, Lindsay, I was thinking of that because there are some times that I've seen phonics instruction that is very drill and kill and repetitive, <laughs> and you wonder what's really sinking in. But that is better than, say, the approach of just surround them in text and they'll get it, or you <laughs> hope to heavens that they get it. And, you know, Stacy, I was just thinking about, because my background is in writing, and that was something that I used to do a lot of when I was younger. It always surprises me when I walk into classrooms, and the the writing is such an interesting thing, because so many people are uncomfortable with it. And if you think we don't know enough about the science of teaching reading, we really don't know anything about the teaching of writing. <laughs> it's an even harder skill. Uh, for individuals, because a lot of people who are teaching are not all that comfortable with their own writing. And so how can how can you teach a love for an appreciation for something that you yourself are saying, geez, I hope no one asked me to write something. So I also think that teachers, it's, it's very interesting. We have this real obligation to know enough about what it is we're teaching that we can impart at least an enjoyment or an enthusiasm or a desire to know about what it is we're teaching. And that's that's a tall ask a lot of times for teachers when you think about it, especially in these fundamental skills that maybe they themselves, this might be new information as we're hearing a lot of times in the science of reading when we're talking about it, this is new information for a lot of teachers, the nitty gritty of how we learn to read. Well, so is the nitty gritty of how we learn to write. And so one thing I think is always interesting is the engagement to always remember that people really love to talk. And that's that innate thing that we do. The foundation of everything is speaking. And so if you always with writing, I go back to that space of, well, then let's have a conversation. And the same can be said of when we're teaching the components of of reading, we're using a lot of our speech. We should be. We should be using a lot of speech. And I just got uh, some really good enthusiastic words from an educator that a lot of people would know, I mean, name drop. But this particular educator was talking about how important remembering to speak and to have dialogue and to have conversation with students, even when we're teaching a sound or a grapheme, and the conversation around that and having students speak, even if it's chorally or individually, however we're doing that, and to remember those opportunities of interaction that should be happening. It reminds me of Anita Archer. I say something, you say something. I say something, you say something. Just the master of getting everyone involved. And then it brings me back to that drill and kill. And I think Anita Archer is the same one that said, we can turn that to drill and thrill. Yeah. And just like Donnell is saying, it's just, you know, the teacher can bring all this emotion and excitement into it. The teacher needs to show his or her enthusiasm, right? And that's infectious. I'm going to add a third one to that because I love what you were saying. So there's drill, thrill, and skill. To me, that's the last piece. You drill, thrill, and skill. Maybe we can make this simple view of phonics instruction or what are we going to call that? So drill and thrill, thrill. equals skill. <laughs> drill times thrill equals skill. I feel like we should design a study to test that. <laughs> Love it. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. And probably last. <laughs> but I like to think about that. 
So um, this has been a really fun conversation and it's helped me to know that our knowledge is important, that science, knowing the science is so critical. And actually one is going to enhance the other too, right? Art is going to make what we learn and know about science come to life. And science is probably, I don't know if you're like, you are, guys are like me in this way. We're curious, we're learners, and that science gets me excited. <laughs> and it makes me want to apply it in new and different ways that are aligned. So I think it is, it's worth focusing on. I am lucky in our college of education, that's actually our focus is to create knowledge and practice opportunities. We have a lot of practicums in our program that I don't often hear of in others. And I think that even though we have both striking a balance, knowing when to add to the knowledge and when to provide the practice is really important. And same with teaching and reading, right? When you think about how much we teach a skill and then we give them lots of opportunities to apply it. So thinking like that too. So when I say the word curiosity, just in closing, let's say the word curiosity and relate it to art and science. How would you connect those? <laughs> well, for know. me, I, I love the, the word curiosity. I think it's a fantastic word. I love pulling that out and thinking about it. In fact, I've used it in a few classes in terms of literature with a few pieces of literature. It's kind of interesting. But for me, uh, putting curiosity with the science and the art of teaching, that to me is teaching. A good teacher has a curiosity for understanding their subject, and you can always have different levels of understanding of your subject, understanding your students, and a curiosity for how to impart that information to your students. Because I wouldn't have gotten into teaching if I didn't have a real curiosity for how people receive information and the best way to give them that information, because anybody can talk about something. But what was it about me that made me think that teaching was something I could do or want to do? And it really was that curiosity for, if I love something so much and I understand it so much, I really want to give it to other people because I had such a curiosity for it. And when you can incite that in somebody else and you see it come alive in somebody else? Well, for me, that's teaching. I mean, that's, that's love and joy. Yeah. And you know what? I actually can't learn something without applying it. Like you're saying, that is what drives me to learn. I don't, I don't do well if I'm expected to learn something in isolation. I'm constantly thinking, how does this apply to my life? How can this apply to my teaching? And I think that fostering curiosity is so important to learning that's what keeps us motivated and engaged. Lindsay, what would you add to that? I just love what both of you said. You both said it so beautifully, but I just think curiosity, what an interesting way to think of bridging the two and really helping, you know, stir up some curiosity in our students is an art that's going to lead to them learning the science. I that's love it. that. Yeah. The word bridge is appropriate. I mean, your words, not ours, but I like that. And, you know, I, little kids are naturally curious. And I, that's one reason I love early elementary, because you just have to go with it and, and fuel it. And it's there with older learners. Now that I'm on the other end of it, it takes more work on my part to uh, spark that curiosity in them. I think they're at this point going through the motions, right? But if you can do that, you've got an engaged and way more capable and knowledgeable teacher. I don't know that I could add anything, but I just had the thought of it really is curiosity that drives when you see a student who is struggling with a particular concept. I need to come up with something. I need to help that student. What can I do to help? The other thing is also listening to what your students tell you to be curious about what they're going to tell you. What can they teach me? And every day they teach me something different. Every day I learn something new about my own ability to teach by being curious about what they're telling me, my students are. So where does passion come into all of this? Curiosity, passion, is passion more related to art or science of teaching? Both for me. I think both, so too. Both Lindsay. for me too. Yeah. I feel like I'm very passionate, very strong feelings on both sides. And you know what? When you're in the classroom of the teacher who's passionate about what they're talking about, you know it. So I love that. And I love that I know so many passionate, curious, smart educators who know how to apply the art <laughs> of teaching to what they do. And I'm grateful that we had this conversation today. It's given me a, a lot to think about 
I know we're ending our episode, but I think I'm going to keep thinking about it. I don't know about you guys. (laughs) Yeah, same. Okay. Well, thank you. And thank you all for joining us. We will see you next time on Literacy Talks. Thanks for joining us today for Literacy Talks, the podcast series for literacy leaders and champions everywhere. Literacy Talks comes to you from Reading Horizons, where reading momentum begins. Join us next time. Oh!